Hi ladies, you're listening to The Goodness Podcast. My name is Noor Tahini. I'm the co-founder of Goodness and I'll be your host today. Goodness was launched in 2018 as a platform dedicated to tackling topics surrounding women's health in a real and honest way. And we're continuing on that mission with the launch of this podcast series, which will feature real women and real stories from the Middle East. My guest on the podcast today is artist, activist, and entrepreneur Elisa Freja. Elisa is the founder of Vomina, a platform that aims to support the entrepreneurship ecosystem in our region by empowering and educating women investors and entrepreneurs. She's joining me to discuss self-love, self-doubt, authenticity, and what it means to stand for women empowerment in today's world. Hi, Elisa. <laughs> Hi, Noor. How's it going? <laughs> it's, uh, it's going good. Yeah, it's going good. Yeah. I'm so happy to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. To give our audience a little bit of insight into what we're doing right now, we're sitting on the floor yes. surrounded by pink couches <laughs> and you're wearing head to toe purple, pink? pink, pink, pink. So you're perfectly matching the room. Yes. With pink glasses, <laughs> pink hair and pink is not my favorite color, but what's your favorite color? Green. Really? Yeah. Goodness is a goodness is a green brand in terms of like colors. Yes, I know. It's all about wellness. And yeah. that's why I feel like green is all about life and nature. And I don't know, it feeds my soul. So I like green a lot. But my hair is pink. So I've been wearing a lot of pink lately. It balances it out. Pink is my favorite Leaning color. into stereotypical <laughs> femininity, I think, is interesting. So Lisa, the first time we ever worked together was over what, five years ago? Uh, six, six years, years ago. ago. Six years ago. And I was still at Savoir Flair and you had just launched Womina and yes. we shot you in Abu Dhabi and I interviewed you about what Womina was and we featured it in Savoir Flair. And I remember that day so well, we shot at number 57 Boutique Cafe. Yes. Remember? You were actually the first ever interview we did. Like you were the first media entity to feature us or like tell our story that's amazing and i think that story is still on savoir flair and that awkward photo of my 23 year old like innocent self is still up there um for the world to see somewhere I <laughs> on the internet. well i remember that day so that was like over six years ago yeah and i like the pants so much i actually bought them and i still wear the pants i wore in that i remember they were like crazy printed they were right? boss lady pants and i was like i need to get <laughs> big girl like business leader boss lady pants yeah so, that was good <laughs> how has the company evolved since since that day how has the company evolved over the past six years dude so much i honestly if i i cringe at the thought of rereading that interview or even <laughs> looking at that photo i should have pulled up some quotes for you man <laughs> because we were we started as a an angel investment platform, mm. a platform that was trying to educate women on tech investing and uh, making it as easy as possible for a woman to invest for the first time. Mm. But I had come from Paris where I was oil painting, studying philosophy <laughs> and like doing like body painting and hosting open mic nights. So I was a creative yeah. and I jumped into this investment space. So I have no idea like how I ended up launching an investment platform and I kind of lost myself there. So the company has evolved, I think, to become a lot more me, mm -hmm. to reflect my authentic self. Mm -hmm. And we now don't do angel investing at all. And we actually in evolved into being a much larger platform of storytelling for women in the Middle East that are doing incredible things and trying to highlight them as role models through video content and documentary kind of mini docs or, or longer term like episodic mm -hmm. documentary series. And we use our knowledge and entrepreneurship to create an accelerator program also to kind of give back to the entrepreneurial community that way. So that's momentum. That's momentum. Yeah. That's uh, the first product that Wamina really put out. The names are awesome. Thank you. Yeah. We even called our media platform Womedia for a while. And then we we're like, Womina, Womedia, Womentum. It's like a lot of woes. What's it called now, the media platform? It's just Womina Media. Okay. <laughs> it was the fight. It was the, it was the fight. They were like, if Womina is a media platform, then it shouldn't be called something else. Yeah. Um, but it's a lot more authentic to me. And the stories we tell are really inspiring. And I am inspired to wait like every day when I wake up now and I go to the office. And I feel like I'm being truer to myself than I was six years ago I remember when I first met you so before that way before that actually in <laughs> Amsterdam 
I think. Oh my gosh, yeah, we had yes. We trip to Amsterdam together like 10 years ago. No, so actually the trip to Amsterdam was um, in 2013, right before I moved to Dubai, the summer before I moved to Dubai. Was it 2013? No, it was before. Or 2012? It was 20, it was 2011. It was June 2011. So wow. we went to Amsterdam in June 2011? Yes. yes. A baby. And I remember you had this crazy stack of bracelets yes. on your hand that you had been collecting for years and years and years. Yes. And when you started Womina, you took the bracelets off. I did. And I remember you telling me that you were going for a more sort of corporate finance like persona. And then <laughs> and then I didn't see you for a long time. And then I saw you again and you had started to rebuild the stack. The mm-hmm. colors in the hair were back. The amazing fun colorful elisa outfits were back and you told me that you had strayed so far from who you were and that you were just coming back to yourself can you tell me a little bit about that and what happened what drove you to stray away from who you are what was the moment you realized that you had gone so far from where you wanted to be and how was the return back to yourself oh my god (laughs) you're gonna make me cry telling this story (laughs) yeah so i did i had a an arm where I had all my travel bracelets for about seven years uh, that had accumulated. And uh, I was so attached to them that I think one of the first shoots I ever did with you was for Dior Beauty. And I refused to remove my bracelets Mm, mm. that we had to do the whole shoot one armed. Yeah, I remember. (laughs) (laughs) And I don't think I ever got booked for Dior Beauty again (laughs) after that. Um, But I was so attached to them as part of my identity. And yeah, when I started you know, really going into the world as the founder of Wemina in this investment, quote unquote, space. I cut my hair to like a bob, a long bob, so it was more professional and uh, took off my bracelets and really, you know, wanted to be taken seriously. And I followed my co-founder at the time who had told me, you know, that we needed to fit in Mm. to the community that we were entering. So if all investors on average are white men in their fifties wearing gray suits, then we have to also wear gray suits. We're not in our fifties and we're not men. So we have to try to fit in and, and be taken seriously that way. And I really got sick of it very quickly. Were you taken seriously? Uh, No. Okay. I think, People spot inauthenticity very quickly. And we were going to be sticking out anyway. Mm. Like we were already the youngest and the only women and the most energetic Mm. or the most passionate in the room. So there was no way I was going to be able to hide that no matter what clothes I was wearing um, and what haircut I had. Mm. So I decided to lean into that. And it started with, you know, Honestly, when I was speaking on panels, realizing that I was almost insulting the audience by being as monotone as the other speakers Mm -hmm. and not being authentic in my voice. And I was like, man, these people are giving us time of their day in sitting here. And these men next to me are like spewing bullshit. You know, I'm sorry, (laughs) but like there's this is what a waste of time this is for everybody. So. I stopped caring and I started speaking openly and being more critical or being more passionate and challenging the people next to me to truly voice their opinions. And that meant that I started leaning into my colors more and I was wearing skirts more because I was like, if I'm a woman, then I'm really going to show femininity or I'm really, if I'm going to be outspoken, I'm really going to show that I'm outspoken. And um, it started that way. And then my co-founder and I eventually split up. And she went back to the U.S. to do her thing, focus more on investing. And I felt very lost. Like I had this company that I'd built that I loved that wasn't working. The business model was failing and it had so much promise and I didn't know what to do. And I had strayed, as you said, so far away from myself. So I had to take a few months to really tap back into who I was and what I truly wanted to do with this opportunity. So that summer, no joke, I dyed my hair pink as like Mm -hmm. holiday pink, you know, just for 10 days with manic panic, like cotton candy or whatever. And um, 
I was having conversations every other day with as many people as possible, exploring who I am and what I want to do and what's the opportunity in the Middle East. And the core of Wamina that I had become attached to was that it became this voice for a community that was completely overlooked. And I loved that community. I wanted to foster that community. So I went back to, you know, what do I want to do? I want to be that voice for the Middle Eastern woman. I want to tell the stories that are not being told. I want to change perspectives towards women, towards the region. And the best way to change those perspectives and to tell those stories is through media mm -hmm. and through video content specifically. Mm -hmm. So I came back, told my team, we're transitioning into a media company. Those of you that want to be on board, let's do this. Those that don't, with all due respect, thank you very much for your time. We rocked the boat a little bit, you know? And eight months later, I launched as a media platform. I had a new team in part. Some of the older team stayed with me. And not only did we launch a media program, but that's when we created the accelerator mm. also to kind of give back to that community with the learnings that we had from the last two or three mm -hmm. years of Wamina. And no joke, with the launch of those two things, I felt like I had control again. And the accelerator took place in Berlin because I was like, I, remember that. I want no strings attached to where our mind can go. I want no like structures in place that can limit our creativity and what we want to do and how we want to do it. I want us to just do whatever we can dream of for the first year and prove to ourselves that we can do it. Yeah. And so I was like, yeah, let's do the best accelerator in the world. So, and an accelerator that's targeted towards women. So how are we going to do that? So we came up with one and we said, Berlin is the wildest, coolest, most exciting place on the planet right now. Let's take all the startups to Berlin and then we'll bring them back to the Middle East to finish the program. And being in Berlin and challenging those startups, I felt like I was going through an accelerator myself mm. and I was pushing my own creativity and like rediscovering my own voice. And season one of Momentum, which is the documentary series about that first season of the accelerator is actually on YouTube and on Facebook right now. And you see my evolution in the show. Also, no you don't just see the startups that we work with, but my story evolves. And in the last episode, you see me crying and hugging my team and like telling them, thank you so much for sticking with me through all of this, because we just did something that none of us had ever done before that none of us thought was capable. We were capable of. Mm. And, um, and yeah, then the colors became permanent and the bracelets are back. Although now they're all Lebanese revolution bracelets. Nice. <laughs> and actually my bracelets are removable other than the Lebanese ones. I still have bracelets, but they're removable ones depending on the colors that I wear that day. Nice. So, so yeah, that's how I kind of found my voice in that, in that way. And, uh, and like, yeah, I rediscovered inner strength and vision, which I had completely lost track of. Do you find that it's difficult to be yourself in general in today's world? No. I... On the, on the contrary, you'd say? <laughs> yeah, I don't find it that difficult to be myself because I'm very happy with who I am and I see a very positive effect mm. of my authentic self on other people. I have a natural energy and a lot of people actually like thrive off that energy yeah. even something as silly as like an insta story where i'm saying good morning people will smile because of that and i realized that that's a beautiful thing and and for something that takes so little effort on my part can actually like impact other people mm. so positively i have to keep doing it so it keeps reinforcing that i should be more myself and actually business wise we've even been supported tenfold since I've become more authentic. More yourself. Yeah. So like we work now with Standard Chartered Bank as one of the main sponsors, for example, on the Momentum Accelerator. And wow. That's literally amazing. in one of the first meetings, they were like, what you have, this thing, and they're kind of like waving their hands in front of my face and me and my team's faces, signifying like whatever you guys look like, whatever this is, we want that. We want the youth. You know, and the managing director of the accelerator, her name's Christina, she actually has half of her head shaved. So it, we, we have, we're yeah. just ourselves, yeah. but 
the work that we do is excellent. And we've convinced our partners of that excellence over and over again. So actually they take us very seriously now, regardless of like how I dress or what I wear. You describe yourself as an activist. Yeah. Yes. If I had to ask you like, what does Elisa stand for? What do you stand for? Like, what's your message? Look, honestly, the first thing that comes to mind is authenticity. Mm -hmm. I think um, the fastest way to be happy in life is to be authentic. And if you're happy, the world is a better place. If we were all happy within ourselves, we pass on less hate and mm. negativity. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think authenticity is really the key to, to world peace, right? And to happiness yeah. to a certain degree. And I want to be able to stand for that. You can be weird and you can be lots of different things. You know, I'm um, Lebanese and American and grew up and born and raised in France, mm -hmm. but I'm also Emirati. So... I'm so many things. I'm an investor, but I'm also an entrepreneur, but I'm technically a producer, yeah. executive producer or a director. Or I'm also a poet or I'm also an activist or I've also, I paint, right? So we can all be so many things and we don't, we shouldn't feel like we put ourselves in one box or we have to give ourselves one label. So kind of own up to your weirdness and your complexity. And I think like, that's like the one message that I, I'd want to be able to share with other people that it's okay to be yourself, your full self. Yeah. You bake also, right? Didn't you work at a bakery? I used to bake. Yeah, 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 I was a baker. Um, I made cakes, but I now am sugar-free. Okay. <laughs> Two years sugar-free no sobriety. Completely? <laughs> Completely. Birthday cakes. No, no, no birthday cakes. Wedding cakes. I haven't baked a cake since New Year's Eve 2013 when I didn't even eat it. Um... It was for my boyfriend. I made him a, a cheesecake on New Year's, but I didn't eat it. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't really miss it, but I feel really good. I feel really good about it. So I don't bake, but um, I channel my creativity in other ways. You also stand for, I guess you'd say, women empowerment. Yes. Right? Hell yes. <laughs> what does that, so what does that mean so to you? So do you. Yes. <laughs> but... I do think that it's a term that's been thrown around a lot lately. And sure. especially, for example, working in fashion, there was a time where every brand wanted you to do a female empowerment campaign for them. And yes. then every car brand wanted you to do fema female empowerment for them. And then I guess every food brand wants you to do female. And it's the more female empowerment there is, the better we are. We all are and the better off we all are. But I do feel like somewhere along the way, it lost a bit of its meaning, you know, it lost a bit of its strength as a term. And I think that in the Middle East as well, our version of female empowerment is very different than what's happening in the US. In general, in the Middle East, the conversation around women empowerment is maybe a little bit more nuanced than in the US. What have you found in your experience working with women? Yeah, I think there's definitely a difference mm. between geographies mm -hmm. and what women empowerment means. But there's also a lot of misconceptions. Mm -hmm. The first thing I hear from anyone outside of the Middle East when I tell them that I work on female inclusion, equality, and women empowerment in the Middle East is like, oh my God, the work that you do is so good. The women mm. there really need it. Oh my God, wow, it's so powerful. And uh, my mom's from California, so that's the accent that I hear <laughs> when I go back. Um, and it's true, it's very important here. But at the same time, in the West, they don't acknowledge that there's even a problem. Mm. So a lot of the raising of awareness is done in the West. Places like Germany, where Angela Merkel has been chancellor for 10 years, still have some of the lowest rates of female inclusion in CEO positions, in board seats, uh, in founding startups that actually get funded. So they don't acknowledge that there's a problem. And therefore, they don't create solutions because they're like, oh, feminism is so a thing of the 70s. We're like mm. so advanced. Emerging markets need that. Developing markets need that. Like the Middle East or Africa mm. or Asia, whatever the other is. Whereas in the Middle East, compared to the middle of Europe, like Germany, in the Middle East, in the UAE, we have more women in ministerial positions. We have more women in government. Yeah. We have more women founded startups. We have more women funded startups. And people just don't hear about that. Now, we also have 
countries that are in like the bottom 15, you know, on the world equality index in terms of female inclusion. So countries where if a rapist wants to marry his victim, he doesn't get arrested, right? That's like, that was still legal in Lebanon until 2016. So like, there's still places that are almost like archaic in mm -hmm, their mindset. Mm -hmm. And the conversation has to differ based on those yeah. geographies. But you you really need to learn the numbers. Like everybody should learn the numbers and understand what their community really needs. Yes. So when you talk about women empowerment being overused, it's because it's been commercialized. It's because Dior put it on a t-shirt and sold that t-shirt for $300. You know? And... Is that because I didn't book you again for another beauty campaign? <laughs> first of all, a thousand percent I should have been part of the feminist... <laughs> Uh, campaign. campaign and that and that collection a thousand percent but it creates this apathy towards the real message mm -hmm. when you start commercializing it you know what I mean so it's definitely a trend and I know that we're riding that wave as Wamina and working with these big sponsors that want to support women empowerment and that in three to five years, they're going to be sick of women empowerment and they'll be like, let's go help the pandas. Mm. Okay. Mm. Or like, let's go save the ocean or like, oh damn, we don't have enough oxygen anymore. Let's focus on oxygen and like cutting carbon emissions because we have five years left to breathe. So I understand that the commercial focus is going to shift. And it's currently been focused on women empowerment for the last like five or six years. But this message needs to be out there. Mm. And what it's doing is very little to our generation, is a lot more powerful to the generation under us. And that's what I want people to really understand is that, you know, in Nigeria, the levels of sexual assault are up in the 90s, 90% 90 of the population. Wow. Okay. The World Health Organization came out with a study that in Egypt, above 95% of people, of women, deal with female genital mutilation. Like, what the hell in 2020? Like, how yeah. is that still a case in our region? So when you start looking at the numbers, you realize, actually, it's good to start this conversation. And in the West, when this stuff is put on a t-shirt and we talk about equality being something as what I would consider simple as equal pay because it's numbers on a yeah. spreadsheet. Just give everybody the same number yeah. on the same spreadsheet. Yeah. It actually gets a lot more complex and it's important to keep driving yeah. that conversation forward. That's, that's exactly what I meant. Like the conversation, the message is the same, but the details of it are so different because like you said, in the U S it's something as simple perhaps as people having equal pay mm -hmm. in the middle East. It's so I just, I just learned the numbers for sexual assault in Lebanon Yeah, because my friend Rana Khouri does a lot of work with, well, she runs phenomenal women and they do uh, phenomenal work. Uh, yes. <laughs> they do phenom phenomenal work, helping women who are, survivors of gender-based violence in Lebanon find work and learn different crafts so that they can sort of escape the situation they're in through financial independence. Mm -hmm. And she does a lot of work for the UN in Lebanon on gender-based violence. And she really, she recently did a, a report. I hope I'm getting all the details right, right, Rana. If I'm not, I'm sorry. But, but basically what I do remember is are the results of her report where she went around Lebanon and she looked at the, the numbers and interviewed women in shelters and worked with a lot of the NGOs like Kafa and Abad there to find out what, what was happening. And she told me, I saw her like a few weeks ago, she said one out of two women in Lebanon, one out of two women in Lebanon has been sexually assaulted. One out of four women in Lebanon has gone to the police for sexual assault and 49% of those reports have been against family members. It's just, for me, it's just crazy. Like if, if you look down and you get granular in the Middle East, there's so much work that has to be done. And you, you, look, around your, you look around in Dubai and it's a completely different ecosystem, but you forget, like you said, how many different levels there are. Yeah, but honestly, like, again, this is not just the Middle East mm. or in France, 
every three days a woman is killed by a man that she knows or she has had a relationship with, okay? It's called femicide. And femicide has its own term, not because we're feminists and it's about killing women. It's because there's a disproportionately high number of deaths of women and all of those deaths are by men that are close to them. In the United States, it's three a day. And the, in France? In France, it's one every three days. One every three days, okay. So the numbers are atrocious. Yeah. Like uh, there, Last year, there was 180-something women that were killed by their spouses or former partners in France. The question of something as serious as violence towards women is not a cultural issue. It's a global issue. It's a gender issue. Mm. The type of violence might change yes. based on the culture. Differ, yeah. But the level of violence or the fact that there's a disproportionately high violence targeted towards women does not change. And that is something that, again, we need to talk about. So back to the point that women empowerment is definitely an overused term because we look at women needing to be empowered. And so the term suggests that women are the are ones weak. who yeah. need empowering. Women yeah. are the ones who need to have work done on them. Yeah. But the truth is that it's actually society as a whole. It's not men specifically, although definitely men need to work mm. on themselves mm. and Men and women need to work on raising men to be open, to yeah, be more yeah. open with their emotions, more authentic so they can let out violence in a more balanced way, right? Women also need to learn to fight for themselves, speak up for themselves, overcome the systemic kind of conditioning that we've gone through. But the biggest issue is that we all in every culture around the world live in a system that has been designed to operate against women, even if it wasn't originally intentioned that way. So women empowerment is just about fighting an underlying system. Mm -hmm. And the term tends to be overused because it targets yeah. women specifically. Yeah. I was so ignorant when I started in this space because in 2013 when I started Wamina we weren't even focused on women actually we were called Abu Dhabi Angels no way <laughs> yeah so it's so terrible and uh and literally like two months before launching we're like it's the name is horrible um but we we both my co-founder and I had grown up in these western cultures that had this kind of stupid superiority complex and a very ignorant, naive perspective that feminism was a thing of the past, mm. that the suffragettes fought for the right to vote in the United States in the 20s, and then the fact that women empowerment movement hit a peak in the 70s, and we were done with it. Just like people think racism was mm. finished yeah. in the when last century. When they abolished century. slavery. Yeah. Exactly, which is not the case in the slightest, right? And slavery still to this day exists everywhere. And Sexism still to this day exists everywhere. So I started learning just little things here and there. And it was the same kind of quote unquote lighter topics. Like women are paid uh, 75 cents to the dollar, mm. right? So women make 27%, 25 to 27% less than men. Okay, that's like the first layer, right? The next layer from that is not only do women get paid less, but women are there are then pressured to buy clothes and mm. look a certain way and spend money on aesthetics and their hair and their nails and the coloring. And so actually women are then pressured to spend more money, even though they make less, to be respected the same as a guy who might wear one suit with like the same shirt and maybe two or three different ties. Yeah. Right? And he doesn't have to groom his beard all the time. He doesn't have to have the same haircut all the time. Like the expectations are completely different. And that's like the second layer, you know? And then you get to the third layer, which is, wait a minute. So this perspective that women have on themselves is actually conditioning. And then you start learning about beauty industries and, 
and fashion industries and the nutrition industries and all of the complexes and mental health disorders that come from all of these things that have been fed to us that have been like created and conceptualized in some capitalist's mind somewhere and then it like drives you crazy but you keep going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and what happened and where did this start and when was the difference established like at this point, I think I have a PhD in gender studies because I've gone all the way to the Stone Age and assess gender roles back then and how they've evolved yeah. until this point. But it's fascinating. My former colleague, Grace Gordon, who's the fashion director at Savoir Flair, has been talking to me for years about this shoot that she wanted to do. And she's been really interested in this idea of what would women dress like today if they hadn't been conditioned to dress for men. Because that the idea is that the high heels, the short dresses, the short skirts, etc., cetera, the, the plunging tops are an aesthetic that was created to be pleasing to men, to be less intimidating to men, to fit into this whole sort of system that we're talking about. And, and she, turned out to be restrictive. So pencil skirts yeah. <laughs> Can't are run impossible anywhere. <laughs> to walk in, plus the heels. Yeah. Corsets, things like that. Yeah. So she, uh, she's been, it's, it's been a long time in the works, but she recently uh, shot something that I think will be published in Savoir Flair's 10 year anniversary book, which comes out soon. But the, the whole premise of the shoot is what would women dress like if they had from the get go decided what they would, what, what they wanted to wear. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. It's incredible. I love yeah. that. Yeah. I love that. And you, it's, it's really interesting because even when you talk about it, like every woman that's hit 30 at this point realizes that flats are more comfortable than high heels. Yeah. I don't know how I used to go out to dinner, to conferences, to speaking engagements, to events in heels, like every day or every other day for years. I literally wore my first pair of Louboutin heels for the first time in like five years to a meeting the other day. And I forgot how to walk in high heels. I was walking like a weird like duck. And then I realized, oh yeah, I have to cross the foot weirdly in front of the other one. Like you have to change your natural... Gait. I think that's what they call it. Your natural gait? Yeah. In order to fit into a shoe, which is supposed to help you do the thing you're supposed to yeah. already do, right? Yeah. So thank God Louboutin do flats now. Yeah. <laughs> See, they do great flats. And they do sneakers, don't they? They do sneakers, yeah. for sure. Really but like you said, sneakers. I think there's a, there's, a, there's a quote that I read recently that said that dieting is the greatest, single greatest sed political sedative that's ever been served to women. Because the longer you're preoccupied with what you look like and what your weight is and everything, the, the less time you actually have to get anything done and to actually stand for something. There is the most mind-boggling history of invented concepts that have been fed to society, uh, targeted towards women, that have completely preoccupied women with something that didn't exist before, right? Like, the w one thing I learned recently, the concept of shaving. Mm. You know, now in the United States, you have, like, up to 75% of the Gen Z population are not shaving their armpits wow yeah and like razor sales are plummeting in the united states and this is insane because a hundred years ago women apparently did not shave up until world war ii it was not an expected beauty standard for women in the united states to shave their underarms and their legs and what happened was the founder of gillette came up with a lie which is that it's less hygienic for you to have body hair so that he could sell more razors to a wider market because men all already had their razors and they wanted to tap into the women's market. So they came up with a lie and started telling women that it was unhygienic when men aren't fed the same lie. Men have underarm hair and they're totally healthy. So why do women have to mm. shave it? And that by 1964, 96% of women were shaving their armpits. So in about 20 years, they basically wow. completely transformed the way that people thought. The same happened with Listerine and uh, halitosis and bad breath. Listerine was a company that sold fo floor cleaner. And they realized, hold on, we can play on people's insecurities here. Our sales aren't doing really well. Let's dilute the formula. 
and um, create something called halitosis, which is a made up word for bad breath, but they made it sound like an actual like condition condition. And they had a bunch of ads with men in white lab coats saying you have halitosis or don't let someone catch you with halitosis at a party and targeted towards women. So women were like, oh my God, I have halitosis. Bad breath became something in the consciousness that people were preoccupied with. And then Listerine, like to this day, rules the mouthwash industry. Here's another quote for you that I read recently. (laughs) (laughs) My brain remembers quotes for some reason. That's good. Mine does it. Okay. The best way to sell something that people don't need is to make them think that there's something wrong with them. Yes. So all of these things, whether it's the diet industry or the underarm razor or labiaplasty you know the the best way to sell something to women that they don't need is to start by making them think that there's something wrong with themselves their authentic selves a thousand percent yeah every single one of those cases proves that Mm -hmm. that's crazy yeah yeah and who is it i think diana vreeland the great diana vreeland editor harper's bazaar for 20 plus years she said don't sell people something that they want sell them something that they don't know they want yet Mm. so it's the same thing this is like the whole concept behind selling people something that's aspirational right that's marketing marketing is all about being aspirational right visual messaging is all about aspiration these influencers online are all about aspirational lifestyles that people go for like you don't need a private jet in a Louis Vuitton bag But seeing these images over and over and over again, you think, oh, they look happy. So in order for me to be happy, I need need a private plane and a Louis Vuitton bag. And it's the same. I need to shave my arms or I need to... uh, Drop 10 pounds. Drop 10 pounds. I need to diet or I need to work out or I need to drink Listerine, right, for example. Or I need to work out with this specific brand because the models in this brand Mm. look happier than the models in this brand. So it's all this like, like conditioned, like control of our own perceptions of Mm. self right body dysmorphia is like the perfect example of this there's something called body dysmorphia to such a degree the messaging affects us that we actually see ourselves differently than we are yeah have you ever struggled with body image issues yes absolutely i think every i think every woman has struggled with body image issues at some point in their life whether they're a young preteen or a teenager, or a grown-ass woman Mm. who's being very successful in her career. What is it that helped you through that? If there's anything that you can pinpoint in specific. You know, one thing that really shifted my thinking was actually educating myself on... The messaging. The messaging and the Mm. level of conditioning that we've actually gone through as a society. And... Then understanding also that every culture has different messaging. In some cultures, lighter skin is more attractive. In some cultures, darker skin is more attractive. In some cultures, hair on your upper lip for women is attractive. Yeah. In some cultures, a big nose is attractive. In some cultures, if you're heavier, you're more attractive. In some cultures, if you're very bone thin, skinny, if you have small feet, if you have big feet, if you have long hair, if you have no hair, if you have a weird shaped head, like... There's every kind of flavor of ice cream out there that yeah. we can be, you know? And understanding that, first of all, it's all conditioning. Whatever I think beauty is has been fed to me over my entire life. The second thing is everything is beautiful to somebody. Mm. And somebody will find me beautiful. Mm. The most important person to find me beautiful is myself. Is you. And the third thing was specifically with my own body image. I reset my own values. So for me, I always struggled with feeling weak, mentally weak, physically weak, emotionally weak. I don't like being weak. I don't like being called weak. So instead of accepting my fears of being weak and giving into whatever pressures and conditioning that come my way, I actually actively work to make myself stronger. And instead of thinking, I used to get sick a lot from sugar, for example, why I was eating sugar, I was living very unhealthily. I was like, instead of saying, I'm so weak, I keep getting sick, I keep getting sick, my body is so weak. I realized, actually, no, my body is very strong. 
it keeps fighting to be healthy again. This sickness is not my body breaking down. It's actually my body fighting something that's hitting me negatively, right? Or I'm so weak, I can't do a pull-up. I can't push this thing. I can't pick this thing up. Actually, no, let me actively go and work and train. Because for me, the gym used to be like, I have to look good or I have to lose weight. And I hated cardio and I hated aesthetics. I hated going to the gym because I have to look a certain way or get a body a certain way. But I love going to the gym to build strength. I love doing things that I wasn't able to do two weeks ago. You know, today I did like a lat pull down and I did it for 27 and a half kilos, which is the heaviest that I've done. This means nothing to a listener, right? But to me, two weeks ago, I did the same thing, but I could only pull like 18 kilos. So I've like, my strength is up and I don't care about how my body is right now because I literally pulled something mm. down that I couldn't pull down before. So like that strength and rewiring it is, is, was absolutely fundamental to me. Same with mental health, yeah. right? Mental health, I'm crying. I feel like I'm going to fail. I definitely have my off months. I definitely doubt sometimes what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, if I'm capable. But I just have to reshape my thinking and realize like I've actually stuck with my business for six years, which is the longest I've ever stuck to something of my own choice. You know, school was not my choice. I was made to go to school. Yeah, I was yeah. made to go to college. I didn't choose to do 12 years of academia and then go into college. I am choosing to stick with Wamina. I chose not to give up. I chose to keep pushing it forward. I chose to redesign and rediscover and challenge myself and push my team. And we're not making money. We have to figure it out and get creative. I chose to do those things and I stuck it out. And to me, that's strength. You seem to be really good at talking to yourself or reframing the narrative. <laughs> Are you no, saying no, that not I'm like, like talking a lot? Way. No, no. <laughs> I mean, I mean. <laughs> Am I rambling? I told no. you to stop me no, if no, I ramble. No, you're not rambling at all. Um, no, not at all. That's not what I meant. I meant you're very good at reframing the thoughts in your head because it's very easy to let negative self-talk sort of run away with you you know like exactly the way you were saying you could you could believe that you were weak or you could believe that you were failing in certain aspects of your life but it seems that you you flip that on its head and you give it a different narrative you give it a positive spin that's what I meant by talking to yourself <laughs> I mean not allowing your thoughts to get the best of you most of the time most of the time so I wanted to talk to you about that about mental health as an entrepreneur, mental health as someone who works with entrepreneur, mental health as a young woman, someone who is trying to make her mark on the world. How do you deal with self-doubt, for example? How do you deal with sort of the darker days? People help me. <laughs> That's the honest truth. It's not like I'm a one woman, like superhero, like magic, you know, voodoo psychic who can tap into my own subconscious and rearrange it I've worked very hard and very long with very talented people to help me get to a point where I have enough awareness to identify my own patterns and to stop myself when I recognize a pattern mm. so that I can reframe it or assess it and then reframe it and work backwards I started seeing a therapist like two and a half years ago, two years ago. Mm -hmm. I have a business coach slash, I'm going to call him a life coach, but he calls himself an executive coach. Okay. He's a friend of mine. Um, business coach, life coach, who I talk to about entrepreneurship, about my business, about me as an individual and my happiness and how can I keep that in line with the work that I do. Mm. I had an amazing partner who knew me better than I knew myself and managed to always help show me an objective perspective of what I was going through. When I saw darker times, he managed to make me see the potential and the opportunity and actually like the, the goodness. This concept of, of strength versus weakness, for example, came from repeated conversations with me beating myself up about my body being weak for ex and him telling me actually no this is your body fighting an illness and when I 
rerouted that, I was like, oh, wow. And I can identify it. And mm. then being able to take that thought process and actually adapt it to other things when I feel weaker or I recognize it. So I have built like a network. I've built, built a network and I talk about it. I talk about these things really openly because it's taboo. Like nobody likes to show the negative parts of themselves. Nobody likes to share the negative parts of themselves, but if we don't, we implode. So we have to. And I realized that a lot of people actually get strength and empowerment from me being so vulnerable and so open. Mm. And if actually I work on myself, I can help people better. So if I work on myself, if I make sure that I have time for my mental health and my physical health, then I can come into the office yeah. a stronger leader, able to give everything that I have to my team and help them through whatever they're going through fully. How did you learn to trust yourself? That's something we were talking about before we started the podcast. Yes. Um, and it's, I told you something that I struggle with, trusting my gut, trusting that I'm doing the right thing and not second guessing myself every step of the way. Every time I kept quiet and doubted my own voice, it came back to bite me in the ass. Mm. <laughs> I contributed to my own mental health deterioration. I contributed to the quality of the business that I was doing going down. I contributed to toxicity levels in my relationships going up. Whenever I gave in to self-doubt, nothing positive ever came from it. So I just shut myself up sometimes and I have to go with my gut and I've also learned that in the beginning when you're unsure of yourself you tend to often go to other people for that reassurance and validation validation yeah. right is my idea good is this business a good idea uh should I make it happen in Dubai or should I make it happen in Lebanon is this the right free zone for me to operate in? Mm. Is this the right bank for me to go to? Is this the right way to launch my business? Is this good branding? No one has ever built your business like you. And so it is very important that you remember that all of those people whose advice you seek will never give you as good advice as you will give yourself they haven't started the same business as you. They maybe started great, successful businesses. It may not be in the same industry. It may not be in the same country. It maybe was at a different time. Maybe they're a male and well-connected, and so their advice is actually totally irrelevant to your experience as a female who's new in this country. So you have to understand that your self-doubt doesn't serve you in any way. It doesn't protect you from the risk that you're taking. Mm. It actually hinders your progress and hinders you from really being authentic and creative when approaching a project that, that you want to start. That's so true. I think it also hinders the development of your trust in yourself. It breaks the connection between you and yourself. If you're constantly bypassing what you think is right and going to someone else for approval again and again and again and again. Yeah, that's, um, would you hire somebody who does that? No, right? The person, the most ideal team member when you're looking to hire is somebody who's proactive, who's confident, who will figure out a solution before the problem mm. even comes Arises, out. Arises, yeah. And who will think fast on their feet and trust their gut and who you can then trust to do that, right? You want to be able to let go and properly delegate as a business mm. leader. So... On one side, you definitely want to hire people better than you. But at the same side, like you have to be able to, to lead by example, right? And if you can't hire someone like yourself, it's, there's a question mark there. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. I guess that's is that advice that you give the people that you work, through, through, work with through the accelerator as well? Absolutely. A lot of it is trusting your own voice. Make sure that the advice that you take is from people with genuinely relevant experience to mm. what you're trying to mm. do, including my own. In your experience, in your personal experience, and in your experience guiding 
the women through Momentum. What is the biggest obstacle standing in the way of female-led businesses in this part of the world? Interestingly enough, this is actually a much better part of the world to be in if Mm -hmm. you're a female entrepreneur. Mm. The ecosystem in the Middle East as a whole is not so developed that it can afford to be very sexist. Mm. In the United States, in the UK, there are so many businesses that investors have to fight to get into the right deals and entrepreneurs really get their pick and there's so many businesses out there that you can like let your biases run free and invest in just the type of founder that you want here in the middle east we don't have that many companies and we don't have that many good companies we have a lot but given the scope of the ecosystem and how early it is investors are really looking for the best company out there, the best performing company. So there actually aren't that many gender specific barriers that women really have to overcome. I think the only barriers is not even an entrepreneurial, an entrepreneur specific barrier, but is more cultural barriers against women in the region, Mm -hmm. which is very often in some cultures, it's taboo for women to work. It's either taboo to be independent um, or it's taboo to make it look like your family needs money or something like this or your husband can't provide for you. That is a very difficult barrier that women have to overcome. And that's whether they're an entrepreneur or they're going to get a job somewhere. And the second thing is women still predominantly have to take on a bulk of the housework. And they tend to be these pillars in their communities. So the biggest hindrance is women just don't have time, actually. They, it's very difficult for them to make the time to be able to fund companies, grow those companies, and, and really dedicate the mental power it takes to pivot and to grow and to be flexible and to identify opportunities, right? Because they are also doing the housework, taking care of the kids, taking care of their sick family members. Uh, they have to get married. They have to, they're stuck, yeah. you know? Um, and, and that's why they tend to take care of like philanthropic endeavors, for example, they won't get paid, but it's like helps the community and it's in your free time and it's very casual. So these are, these are the most cultural barriers that are in place that women really need to overcome is is being able to allow for themselves to choose Mm. what they do with their time what's the dream with womina what do you hope to accomplish global domination (laughs) (laughs) nobody's safe (laughs) look the goal for womina is that womina doesn't need to exist anymore the whole point of a platform that promotes equality is for there to be equality so For me, Wamina will continue to affect equality on a global scale to the point that we have it (laughs) Mm. and men and women are seen as equal and as equally worthy of rights and opportunities. That's it. I hope that they come sooner rather than later. Inshallah. <laughs> Inshallah, dude. Inshallah. All right. Just to wrap things up, I wanted to ask you to leave our listeners with one Elisa nugget of advice for finding for finding and owning who you really are. That's so much harder to, to come up with than you think. Could be. Look, the only way that I found out who I really am is when I lost myself to such a point where like I was depressed. You know, when you lose your when you when you feel lost, like identify what is missing. And whatever is missing is who you are. You know, I Mm. I don't know. I only know it from the void. Yeah. I only know it from the void. When I was living a life for another person, for my co-founder, for my father, I 
it didn't feel like me. And I felt like color was missing from my life. And I saw that and I grabbed it. And every single day I add more color to my life. Just to make sure it's not going Just to away. make sure it's not there. And I'm still not there, by the way. It's like, I'm trying to live my most authentic self, but I'm still not there. Yeah, because I think that what's so interesting about the conversation we've just had is that a lot of it comes back to being authentic to who you are. Mm-hmm. Um, whether that is in the way that you're doing business, whether that is in dealing with outside pressures, And we've kept coming back to that. Mm. So I always think of you when I think of like being yourself. Aww. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> maybe oh, because of all you. the conversations we've had about it. And yeah. And maybe because you've seen my evolution yeah. of like yeah. having lost myself and later found and fostered a truer version of myself. And um, yeah, I feel like that's maybe it is in order to really love and nurture an authentic self you have to just acknowledge that you are a complete person that you can have many interests that you are complex and you're this beautiful like cluster of celestial stardust like you're random and and beautiful and like you're a total anomaly right so accept it And we're not supposed to fit into anything. We're mm. just a cluster of beautiful magical molecules. So it's okay to be that, to be whatever you are. Yeah. And once you tell yourself it's okay, it's okay to be sad right now. It's okay to be happy right now. It's okay to feel good wearing all black. It's okay to, I don't know, want to sing opera every day to myself, uh, even though I'm not a good singer. It's okay to be a geek about Pokemon Go, you know, whatever. Still? Are you still on that game? No, I want a Harry Potter version of it, though. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's called Wizards Unite. I'm a big Harry Potter fan. Huge Harry Potter fan. Huge Harry Potter fan. Huge Harry Potter fan. Oh my God, huge. okay, so we need to talk Harry about Potter this after. Of, of Pokemon Go. Um, yeah, and that's okay that a boss lady who runs, like, the biggest platform yes. for women's empowerment in the Middle East is also a total Harry Potter geek who plays... a game on her phone every once in a while or who writes poetry and puts it out there yeah um or who paints tiny little chairs from ikea in her free time no way yeah <laughs> <laughs> learn something every day i think that's to kind of sum up what you just said is <laughs> is is talk to yourself no <laughs> learn who you are no embrace the m- multiple facets of who you are I think is what I'm taking away from this because you can have 50,000 different facets and they don't necessarily have to match with each other. They definitely don't. Yeah. And you can even be a paradox within yourself. Mm. It's totally fine. But if, if you don't accept it, then nobody else will. Yeah. And once you start accepting it, you'll be surprised that people will accept you. Yeah. Try it. Try it today, ladies and gentlemen. Let me know how it goes. I'm definitely going to try it. You've given, me, <laughs> you've given me so much to think about. Thank you, Elisa. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast Thanks, today. Thanks, Noor. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening today. If you're not familiar with Goodness, head to www.goodness.me to access the online platform and articles and follow us at Goodness on Instagram. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate, review, and share it. And we'll see you next week.